Good morning. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, we're just going to give a couple minutes for people to log in and then we'll begin our program. So as we wait for additional attendees to join, I just want to make a few logistical notes at the top. Um, so we are recording this session in case anyone who was not able to attend live would like to review the information later on. Um, in addition, we've enabled live transcript as a feature for this webinar. So there's there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that allows you to turn on closed captions if you'd like to use that feature. All right, we still have additional people logging in, um, but I'm gonna get started. Um, good morning, and again, thank you all for joining us. My name is Joanne Kilgower, and I'm the Executive Director of the Ohio River Valley Institute. This morning, we are here to release our new report, Diversified Energy, a Business Model Built to Fail Appalachia. For those who have just logged in, I mentioned that we are recording this session and we have enabled the live transcript option at the bottom of your screen. The briefing will begin with a panel discussion from the three authors of the report, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So please use the Q&A or chat function to ask any questions that you might have as the presentations move forward, and I'll gather those for Q&A at the end. I'm now pleased to introduce our panel. Today, we're joined by Ben Hunkler, our communications manager for the Ohio River Valley Institute, as well as the three authors of this report, Ted Bettner, senior researcher at the Ohio River Valley Institute, focusing on pathways that bring sustainable economic development and shared prosperity to the region through research and analysis. Ted has over 15 years of public policy experience and prior to joining Orvi, Ted was the founding executive director of the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. We're also joined by Kathy Hippel, a professor of finance with Bard College's MBA in Sustainability Program. Kathy is currently a research fellow with the Ohio River Valley Institute and a former financial analyst with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. We're also joined by Dr. Anthony Ingrafia, the Dwight C. Baum Professor of Engineering Emeritus at Cornell University. Dr. Ingrafia holds a BS in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Notre Dame, an MS in Civil Engineering from Polytechnic Institute of New York, and a PhD in Civil Engineering from the University of Colorado. Dr. Ingrafia's research concentrates on computer simulation and physical testing of complex fracturing processes. He has authored with his students and research associates over 250 papers in these areas. Thank you all so much for your work on this report and for joining us here this morning. I'll now pass things over to Ted Bettner to get us started with an overview of this report. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne, for the great introduction. Uh, ben is going to put up some slides uh, just to sort of give a preview. So what will happen is I'll talk for a little bit, uh, hopefully not too long, about the report, and I'll pass it off to Kathy Hippel, and uh, Kathy will pass it off uh, to Tony and Graffi to talk about the different sections of the report we looked at. Uh, ben, you can go to the next slide. So one of the big questions is, you know, why are we looking at one company today? Why are we interested in a, a gas company, primarily, that operates mostly in Appalachia? Well, there's several reasons that we're looking at this company today. One reason is it's a high volume. It has a high volume of low volume wells. So this is a very large oil and gas company. When we look at the wells that they own, uh, there was a recent report done by Bloomberg that described it as an empire of dying wells in Appalachia. And it's by far the largest well owner in Appalachia and the United States. Uh, and another reason was, is that uh, this country over the last, uh, probably the last you know, decade, we've discovered that we have an abandoned and orphan well crisis. According to several studies, including the EPA, we have about 2.1 to 2.3 million unplugged abandoned wells in the US. And in the states that we look at in this report, we look at Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, we have over 69,000 documented orphan wells 
and that would cost about 4.6 billion to clean up. And we have another 148 to 638,000 undocumented orphan wells in these states. So you can get up to almost $45 billion according to state figures of how much it costs to plug and abandon these wells. And these figures come from the IOGCC uh, and a recent uh, report that we put out a couple weeks ago. Another big reason is, so we have over about a million wells, active wells in the United States. We have over about a little over 275,000 uh, in the four state region of the Ohio Valley. Uh, and one of the huge problems is the bonding coverage. So the financial assurance uh, that incentivizes companies to ensure that they plug, reclaim and remediate these wells is less than 1% of the cost to do so. So there's lots of worry that because we have inadequate financial insurance on these wells, that they could be wards of the state and they could join those wells that are already orphaned that I talked about earlier. Another reason too is the climate crisis. The, the US energy system is moving away from fossil fuels to meet carbon reduction goals. One recent analysis that came out two years ago projected a 40% decline in natural gas production from 2020 to 2050. Uh, and this was their most optimistic scenario. So we know going forward that, you know, with that, unless there's some huge technological breakthrough when it comes to CO2 storage, that we're going to probably be using far less gas today. This means that we could not have the money set aside from industry to pay for this. And so uh, looking at, you know, who would be the biggest company that would have the most risk if, we see these huge declines in production and we have an inadequate amount of money set aside. Diversified is the company that's going to come up. And it's not because they produce the most, it's because they own the most wells. And each of these wells can cost anywhere, you know, from 20 to $157,000, according to these four states, according to their Department of Environmental Protection or their oil and gas regulators. Next slide, Ben. So this gives you sort of a preview of the wells that Diversified Energy Corporation owns in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Kentucky. As you can see, they have about close to 63,000 wells uh, and, a, and about 53,000 of these are producing wells. Some of these wells are inactive, uh, roughly a little over 2,000 are plugged. Uh, some have been canceled, uh, some have been permitted but not drilled. Uh, but this gives you a rough landscape of where these wells are located. And we were able to use this information because uh, of the Capital Forms upstream database, uh, which is a database of well attributes and production for all of the companies and operators in the region. And it's been a huge critical part of this understanding as, as our ability to use that database. Otherwise, we wouldn't have access to this information. A lot of things in this report wouldn't have been possible. Uh, so some of the key attributes of diversified wells, when we look at their inventory, one thing we find is that they're old. So more than half of the wells in their inventory are 20 years old. And this is a concern because typically wells can last, you know, uh, you know, between 20 and 40 years. These are mostly conventional wells, so they usually don't have a longer lifetime. Sometimes wells can last 100 years, but typically they're in that 30 year range. Also, when we looked at some of their wells, we found that about 96% of the wells in this four state region are vertical wells, mostly conventional oil and gas wells, and only about 3% are horizontal wells. And a good portion of the horizontal wells are high volume hydrofracking wells. And when we looked at production, what was very fascinating to look at is that while you know the vertical wells, the conventional wells made up 96% of their wells, you know, they only made up about 59% of production. So uh, about 40% of diversified production just comes from a few hundred wells. So it's very few of these wells are actually providing a, a good chunk of their production, about 40%. And when we look at the region as a whole, all of the active wells in the region, the producing wells, uh, we find that about diversified owns about 28% of all producing wells in the region. So more than uh, one in four wells in this region that are producing are owned by Diversified Energy, uh, but they're only responsible for about 2% of total oil and gas production in these states. So they own you know, more than one in four wells 
but they're only responsible for about 2% of the total production. That's mostly because these are low volume uh, wells, uh, stripper wells. Most of all of the wells they own are stripper wells. Uh, and next slide, Ben. And there's various uh, definitions of those, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this gives you an idea of, uh, you know, just how many wells they own compared to other companies in the region and where they are in production. So if you look at just these four states, you can see that Diversified is by far the largest owner of oil and gas wells, followed by EQT. Uh, and EQT is the largest producer of oil and gas production in the region. Uh, so you see a huge difference between how many wells they own and how much oil and gas they're producing. And this can be an issue too, when you're talking about you know, plugging a lot of wells, these wells generally cost in the range of a very similar amount. Conventional wells can cost to plug about half the cost of uh, uh, high volume hydro hydraulic fracking wells. Uh, so they, don't, they own so many that this puts a huge liability on their books, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Next slide, Ben. Okay, uh, so one thing we did uh, using the analysis uh, uh, and using uh, the Capital Forms Upstream database was to look at the wells by production. And there's various definitions. Generally speaking, the uh, Energy Information Administration and the IRS calls a stripper well anything that's below 15 barrels of oil equivalent today. That's about 90,000 cubic feet per day if we're looking at gas or uh, E stands, MCF stands for uh, equivalent. So um, we're looking at stripper wells. Um, it's about 15 below, 15 barrels of oil equivalent per day or below. And then there's marginal wells. So the IOGCC defines those as 10 barrels of oil equivalent a day, about 60,000 cubic feet of gas equivalent. And then we looked at some other definitions from other states, because uh, most states don't define these things in their state code. Uh, and we looked at the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission recently to look at how they define these. They think that anything under five barrels of oil equivalent day is a financially distressed well. And they consider anything under one barrel of oil equivalent day as an uneconomic well. And in an analysis that we did, looking at diversified wells, we looked at defining our own uneconomic well, what we call a highly uneconomic well. And what this means is likely that the expenses to, uh, of the well are generally greater than the amount of revenue that's coming in. And for companies, that's okay over a couple of years, but eventually those wells will need to be plugged. Uh, and that can present a huge problem. So many of these low, low producing wells, there's a good argument to be made that some of them should already be plugged because they're not producing and enough paying quantities in order to make money. And we look at them as a whole, you can see in this chart here about how many, you can see that over half could be defined as uneconomic wells. And then about 38% of their wells are financially distressed. And the other, and the other uh, 4% are either marginal stripper or they're higher producing wells. So you have a huge inventory of wells that we talked about. Uh, and for the large part, most of them are highly either financially distressed or uneconomic. And that presents a huge risk to states because that means these wells, as they get older, will have to be, have to be plugged and abandoned soon. So it presents a huge issue looking into the future of when this will happen. Next slide, Ben. And one thing we looked at uh, was Diversified's well inventory and plugging and abandonment plan. You'll see that in the report a lot, P&A. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as uh, plugging and restoration or reclamation. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as decommissioning. So what we did uh, was just to present a chart of some of the uh, things that Diversified said that they were planning to plug. Uh, over the last couple of years, they have estimated that they plan to retire their inventory of wells over a 75 year period. And they've done this for several years. And in one report, they gave us some estimates about how many wells per year they plan to plug and when they plan to plug them. And what you can see from the chart is that most of the well plugging that's happening is happening after 2050. That's when a large majority of these wells they plan to plug. And the problem is, you know, 
questions arise of whether the company will be around at that point, whether they'll have sufficient money to plug those wells uh, when so many uh, of their other wells might not be producing as much oil and gas as they are today. And you know, one thing we looked at as well is that each of uh, the four states that we mentioned, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky, uh, diversified has state consent agreements about how many wells they're gonna plug per year. Uh, and we looked at that and how many wells they said they're gonna plug over the next several years. They plan to plug about 200 per year going from 2022, 2023 forward, and then gradually escalate the number of wells they plan to plug in the future. And one of the things that we, you can see from the chart is that about 96% of the wells just in the Appalachian Basin uh, would not be plugged after these state agreements that they have. So that's a really broad concern. Uh, next slide, Ben. And finally, one of the last things, uh, one of the things that we did in this report too was to look at assumptions going forward. Uh, so how much commodity production, how much commodity revenue will they have in the future based on their current production rates and their decline rates? So most recently in their annual report, they said that it cost them about 22,500 per well uh, to plug, which is very, which is less than half of, and that's being generous of what uh, states have said that plugging costs are. But we went ahead and used this very low number of 22,500. And if you ask state oil and gas regulatory commissions, whether they can plug a well for 22,500 on average, I don't think you're gonna find that they can do that. Um, so when we look at their well inventory of about 65,000 wells, and this is not including their plugged wells and some of the uh, other wells they have, they have permits for that they have not drilled, but we use a broad base of 65,000 wells, which includes about 3,000 wells in the central region as well. So for this chart, we're looking at their entire well inventory. And we use a production decline rate of about 9%, that their wells will decline in production about 9%. And then we use a forecast of, of a natural gas price going forward. And we also add an additional 16 cents to that price because uh, diversified also about 10% of their commodity revenue comes from oil and natural gas liquids. And we used uh, the proposed schedule and modified version of the schedule over 75 years. And what we did was try to project out the commodity revenue. And what we found is about, about 20, 20, 2056 that their commodity revenue uh, is actually going to be lower than their annual P&A costs. And one thing we didn't look in this report at all, we didn't consider their operating expenses. We didn't consider a decline in production because of meeting carbon reduction goals. We didn't consider the various other factors. We tried to be as conservative as possible. And I think what this chart shows that it would be very highly unlikely to be able to meet these plugging obligations based on their current well inventory. And uh, now I'd like to hand it over for Kathy to talk more about this inventory and, this, and the business model that's incorporated in this. Thank you very much, Ted, for the excellent uh, overview of Diversified and why we have all found it so fascinating to study. Um, I ended up being invited to uh, participate to look mostly at the company's financials and worked with Ted on that model to see if it was going to be possible based on the revenue that the company is likely to generate based on mostly natural gas, about 90%, some natural gas liquids and a tiny amount of oil. And using, um, again, we tried to use industry um, norms, but in this case, it was the EIA projections for that. And then what I've tried to do in analyzing the company's financials is to look specifically at the company's published because they are a publicly traded company. They're traded on the London Stock Exchange. They do report quarterly and annual financial filings. And so looking at that, reading through the earnings transcripts where they speak to their investors publicly to get all of the data that we've used that underpins our financial findings. So what we realize is the company relies on many questionable assumptions that are far from industry norms. And some of the accounting practices, I would argue, are also 
questionable or they're very uncommon at, at best. Um, I'd like to focus on just a few of what we discovered in our analysis. And the biggest one is the asset retirement obligation, also known as an ARO. And one of the things that they have done, which is highly unusual, is that once they have um, acquired other companies, um, Wells, and this is a company that has built its business on multiple acquisitions over the past few years, particularly 2018, they made several large acquisitions. And they um, numerous times took the previous owner's AROs and revalued them at a much lower amount. Um, they also, in the additional AROs, they used assumptions that are way outside the industry norms. Um, we could get into this, but they used an average for their inventory of wells of saying that they plan to plug and abandon them with an average time of 50 years. And they've extended these well lives through 2095. They've also used something called a gain on bargain purchase, which is so unusual that um, many people in the industry and in any industry um, for publicly traded companies almost never sees. This is not a common accounting practice. Um, and we'll get into what this does. It actually um, adds to their income, but the company does not actually get cash for this and they don't pay taxes on it. Um, and finally, one of the things we highlighted in the report is the um, Diversified has taken advantage of the federal marginal well production tax credit over the past five years. Um, the last two years, they took more than $80 million each year. It was generated, and now they have a tax loss carry forward, I mean, a, a federal, an unused um, marginal well tax credit of about $183 million. And this can be carried forward for the next 20 years through 2041. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these points. If you could go to the next slide, please, Ben. So the first one I noticed or that I highlighted before was that um, in 2018, there were two large acquisitions where Diversified purchased around 11,000 wells from CNX, a publicly traded company, primarily in Appalachia, and an additional 11,000, approximate, well, approximately 11,000 wells from EQT, which is another large publicly traded company, primarily located uh, its operations in Appalachia. And in each case, um, the prior owner, CNX, and EQT respectively, had the AROs on their books associated with those 11,000 wells at approximately $200 million. After Diversified purchased these wells, they put, um, they put the AROs for those specific wells they marked them down or they revalued them at 14 million and 26 million respectively and didn't give, an, to my mind, an adequate explanation for this fairly substantial, as you can see, revaluing where they reduced them uh, massively. Um, and this practice is based on using very different assumptions than the prior owners had used. EQT, for example, when they sold the 11,000 wells to Diversified specifically noted that they had assumptions for the cleanup costs or the decommissioning or PNA costs that they had used, but they expected might even go higher in the future as states would be putting more pressure on um, producers to PNA these wells and that the cost might actually go up. So we found it very puzzling that Diversified in fact marked them down, the AROs. 
And let's keep one thing in mind. AROs are only a book entry on the financial filings of a company. It doesn't mean that Diversified has actually put money aside, either the 14 million or the 26 million. Neither had CNX or EQT. This is a book entry, but it's a very significant one because investors, including bondholders and stockholders, want to know what the financial um, situation of the company is. So that's why they look to the accuracy of financial filings. Um, the next thing that they did on the next slide, please, Ben, is that to look at their AROs, again, asset retirement obligations on their books, they have used some questionable assumptions for their um, 60, five to 67,000 wells that they will need to P&A at some point. And one of them, as Ted showed you in that slide, is to suggest that they're going to actually begin doing this at only 200 wells per year. Last year, for example, they P&A'd only 136 of their nearly 70,000 wells. So, um, they're talking about when they are likely to do this, only 200 wells per year, maybe going up to three or 400 at some point. But they suggested in 2017 that the economic lives of their wells would end in 2047. By 2018, without any explanation, they said that the economic lives of their wells would last through 2093, and they've increased that to 2095. So they're still expecting that the economic lives of these wells that are already 20, half of them are 20 years, uh, another third, uh, uh, approximately a third of them are already 30 years old. The expectation is, according to Diversified, that they could last through 2095. And again, this seems to be well beyond industry norms. Um, so we think that this is a questionable assumption. The other questionable assumption with the AROs is to use a plugging cost that is well below. West Virginia, for example, has put an estimate out there of over $150,000 per well. Um, other states, such as Pennsylvania, is talking about closer to fifty dollars to $60,000 per well. And diversified, having an opportunity to pick among sixty-five dollars to 70000 wells, picked 136 wells to P&A last year and said last year they were able to do it for 22500 So that is going to be the number they've used down from the 25000 that they'd been using the prior year. So now they're using 22500 to 23000 something in that range to put an ARO. And so why does this matter? Well, again, this is on the books and we think we ran some numbers and I'll show you on the next slide, please. That if actually, if you could go to the following one after this one, Ben. Hmm. I think there was one that if they properly priced their AROs, we believe that they would be between they are right now on their books at 525 million. But we believe if they used different numbers, um, for example, $50,000 per well, which is again, what some of the states are using, we believe that they would actually be, and if they used an average life, not 50 years, but 15 years, we believe, thank you, Ben, we believe that their AROs would go from 525 million up to, if they used 50,000 per well with an average life of 15 years, their AROs should be 2.1 billion in today's dollars, discounting them back. Or if they use 75,000, their AROs could be as high as 3.2 billion. So we believe that this is a very um, unrealistic number, perhaps to use only 525 million on their books. 
The final thing I'd like to just mention is that they've also employed something that is very unusual in the business. And for the first time in their financial filings last year, they talked about this gain on bargain purchase. And it's so unusual that I think you could really ask many people with a CPA degree, how often do you come across a gain on bargain purchase? And what this essentially is saying is almost as every year since 2014, Diversified has put in their income statement, one of the three financial statements that a company must do, that they have been able to go in and buy things at such a discount and that when they then go back and look at the numbers and do some financial analysis of their own, they say, wow, we've made a profit from day one. And they put this profit on their income statement and it boosts their income, but they don't actually pay taxes on that. But it serves to, as you can see from this, with the um, with this in some years, such as 2018, the gain on bargain purchase represented 59% of their operating profit in that year. You also can just notice looking at this blue dotted line, if you're wondering why it was so negative, the company has been unprofitable the last two years. They've had very high revenues in 2021, but they had huge hedging losses in 2021. So that explains that. And for those of you who are interested in getting into some more of the details, we, and thank you to Ben, on the next slide, you'll see we did a walkthrough on a year by year basis of some of these questionable accounting and financial practices, starting with 2014 and going all the way through their marginal well tax credit, which is a federal tax credit that is offered to companies that have very low producing um, wells. And it is only available when prices are very, very low. So they've been able to take advantage of that in 2020 when natural gas prices were very low and then the beginning of 2021. And as I mentioned before, they have taken advantage of this, not taken advantage, it's a legal program. It was put forth in 2004, uh, designed for perhaps a different time um, to keep these wells operating. So they now have $183 million of a federal tax credit that they will be able to use for the next 20 years. They can also carry it back five years if they had chosen to. So with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to my colleague, Tony, who can get into what they've done with methane emissions reporting that also has raised some eyebrows. Thank you, Kathy and Ted, for that introduction. As Kathy mentions, my responsibility on this report was to investigate uh, methane emissions, natural gas emissions from diversified wells. It's well known now that decreasing methane emissions into the atmosphere is extremely crucial in our fight against climate change. And it's well known that oil and gas wells can leak methane into the atmosphere. So given the size of Diversified, uh, we de decided to investigate how Diversified is reporting its methane emissions. Like all operators in the state of Pennsylvania, Diversified is required by the state to measure, not estimate, not calculate, but actually measure its natural gas leakage from all of its wells four times per year and report those leakages once a year to the state. The state, PADEP, then publishes a database that's publicly available for analysis. So the first thing we did is analyze the data as reported by Diversified. And on the first pass through, you see this chart starting in 2014 and up until the end of 2020. On the left, you can see the leakage rate in cubic feet per day. That's the red line. And on the right, you can see the number of wells that were operated by Diversified. 
And as you already heard from Ted and Kathy, the number of wells drastically increased stepwise year to year, tens of thousands of wells accumulated from 2014 to 2020. And when I looked at the leakage self-reporting, I saw this red line. And at first I said, well, that seems right because obviously as the number of wells goes up, the leakage goes up because many wells leak. But then I noticed that starting in 2017, the leakage started to decrease, which was not quite what I expected. But then I investigated farther and realized, Ben, you can click one more time, that this image is a mirage because it doesn't show what Diversified was doing about the leakage from the 20,000 wells it was acquiring from other operators. It's not shown in this chart. So we did a very deep dive into publicly available data. We did an analysis. We wrote a number of computer programs to plot the results. And if we go to the next slide, this is what happened. So we determined that over the years 2014 to 2020, Diversified came to own 22,384 wells in Pennsylvania. Back in 2014, on the left of this chart, 20,000 of those wells, 90% of them, were owned by other operators. And those other operators were reporting not 100,000 feet per day of leakage, 100,000 cubic feet per day of leakage, but 3 million cubic feet per day of leakage. In 2014, Diversified was a minor operator. They only had 1,400 volt wells. And as the previous chart showed you, they were reporting a relatively minuscule amount of leakage, 51,000 cubic feet per day. But fast forward to 2020, when 96% of those 22,384 wells were owned by Diversified, suddenly, startlingly, inexplicably at first, that 3 million cubic feet per day of leakage had been reduced to 140,000 cubic feet per day. Caught my eye. So we went deeper and tried to figure out how could that happen? Other operators have a large number of wells with large leakage rates, but very soon after Diversified acquires those wells, the leak rates either go to zero or to some very small number. So go to the next slide. And here are the techniques that we determined, we discovered that Diversified was using. And we call them loopholes and emissions leading to a mirage. So the first loophole, and it's legal, the PADEP permits all of these, what I call loopholes, for any operator reporting as required, it's self-reported leakage. So Diversified reported that a well was inaccessible for measurement 3,238 times during that six year period. Remarkably, those wells were reported accessible by its previous owner 2,000 times. So previous owner could access the wellhead to measure leakage, diversified reports that it can't. Second loophole, as I said, every operator, all 683 operators in the state of Pennsylvania must report at least once a year on their conventional wells, four times a year on their unconventional wells, so Diversified over that six year period sent the PADEP 90,443 reports. 40% of the time, they said, we can't make a reliable measurement. I know we're required to, but we can't make one for one reason or another, we're not able to do the required measurement of leakage. So in those 41% of those 90,000 reports, there could be a well or multiple wells with small leakage, no leakage, or could be super emitting leakage. We do not know. Third loophole, again, legal. It's okay for an operator to say, we're not going to make a measurement this year because we don't think it's applicable to this well. For example, the well might already be plugged or they might've sold it in the previous year 
So 9,500 times Diversified said, we're not gonna issue you a report with a measurement of leakage because we don't think it applies to this well. But curiously, 9,458 of those times, there were subsequent reports for the same well where it was applicable. It's either applicable or it's not applicable. You can't have it both ways. It can't, a well can't go from plug status to unplug status. It can go the other way, but not that way. You can't sell a well and then rebuy the well. So this is curious. Also, Diversified actually failed to file a report 1,700 times at an increasing rate year to year. Every year, there are more missing reports. And finally, when we went very deeply into each individual well, 22,384 wells looked at, there are many what we call aberrant year-to-year -year reports, especially for the wells that were previously reported by previous owners to be very large leakers. And during Q&A, if you wanna know what I mean by aberrant, I'd be glad to tell you. And Ben, if we go to the final slide I have for you, the bigger picture. First of all, all the numbers I showed you are self-reported. That's not particular to Diversified. All the operators are reporting their own emissions. PADEP is not sending inspectors out to make measurements or any other third party or third party. So these are unverified numbers. But we do know for certain that whatever numbers are being reported are lower bounds. For reasons I just showed you of those loopholes. And the sum total impact of those loopholes is that whereas the other 682 operators in the state of Pennsylvania, on average, report that 3.4% of their wells are leaking, Diversified says that less than 1% of their wells are leaking. So we're missing information. And finally, I emphasize that what I'm reporting is only for Pennsylvania. 22,000 some wells diversified operates in Pennsylvania. And as you've heard, there are 40,000 plus more wells in the Ohio River Valley with unknown methane leakage numbers. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to Q&A. Thanks very much to all of our panelists, the authors of this report, um, and thanks to all of you who have um, stayed tuned in here. We have a couple of questions, um, the first of which comes from Mike Lee, and the question is for <laughs> Kathy. Um, a lot of diversified wells belong to large companies like EQT, Chevron, and others. What would their motivation for selling to Diversified be? It seems like they are looking for a way to get plugging op obligations off their books. Uh, thank you for the question, Mike. Um, first of all, it's EQT and actually uh, CNX. Um, CVX um, is the ticker symbol for Chevron. So it was CNX that sold um, 11,000 wells and EQT that did a couple of sales. And we don't know necessarily um, companies when they divest their assets, they don't have to say we're divesting for any particular reason. They often say it's for strategic objectives. But remember, a lot of the operators decided to focus um, some of their attention on what we call fracking wells or um, shale wells. And so these might have been the old end of life conventional wells for the most part. Um, it is true that when they, um, these wells were sold, these sellers get to take the asset retirement obligations off their books. And you're right, they don't have to then be responsible for the plugging and abandoning costs. So the PNA costs go away, the AROs go away, and guess what? They do get some cash because um, Diversified pays them for this. So that's one of the concerns that we have is that um, Diversified has built its business on a large acquisition strategy, and they plan to move beyond Appalachia, 
and they plan to move increasingly into beyond gas wells, beyond conventional wells, and they seem to be moving across the United States. So this is right now a regional potential problem, but it could become a national problem if diversified continues to acquire so many. And as it seems obvious, there may be some incentives for operators to offload or to divest their wells to diversify. Thank you. Um, we also had a question um, from Reagan in the in the Q and A, which Ted you answered in the chat. But I just want to make sure that we um, share the information about the where the well data came from. Yeah, yeah I mean this report. Uh, would not have been possible without uh, the uh, the Capital Forms upstream database, which provides an invaluable tool to be able to look at company specific data and production data uh, across the Appalachian Basin. And one of the most unique things about the data is that its ability to take all of these subsidiaries that operate in the region, because we know companies have sometimes dozens. Uh, and also to be able to link those back to the parent operator, the top parent operator. So uh, the capital form, it's been invaluable. And I highly recommend others to use that uh, database because it allows to get more granular analysis about this. Uh, and this database is just taking data from sta state oil and gas divisions and putting it into a form, just like some other databases like Inveris and put it into a form. But what's unique is that company specific information and the ability to analyze that data, to look at decline rates, to look at other factors that are crucial to, for investors especially, to look at that analysis and to make decisions based on that. But it's also great for researchers and uh, I would say uh, state and oil gas regulators too, especially if we wanna fund some of the uh, orphan wells that could possibly have owners it's invaluable, be invaluable uh, for them, I think. Thanks, the data that we used to do our methane emission analysis is, as I said, publicly available. It's gathered by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection as self-report information from the hundreds of operators. And I just posted the website where anybody can go in and download uh, the spreadsheets uh, that contain all the data that we mined. I warn you that these spreadsheets are very large because there are multiple reports every year for hundreds of operators. Um, and so it does require, if you want to go to the level of detail that we did, some detailed analysis, some programming to extract the data, mine the data from those spreadsheets and present it in such a form that it makes some sense. But it's publicly available data and anybody who wants to try to reproduce the numbers that we've reported is perfectly free to do so, and I'm confident that they would arrive at the same conclusions. Thanks, Tony. Um, while we have you, Dr. Ingrafia, I wonder, uh, Mike Lee has an additional question for you. Um, does the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection bear some responsibility for letting Diversified get, it, get away with under-reporting its methane emissions? I would never want to accuse the professionals at the PADEP of dereliction of duty. No, what I would say is that the PADEP has been crying loudly for many years for increased people power so that they can do their jobs better. In a sense, we academics are outsourcing. We're outsourcers. The PADEP is in many cases relying on people like us to do the work that they don't have the person power to do because they're underfunded. That's not a surprise. Everybody knows it. And it's not only in Pennsylvania. Uh, Ted and Kathy have gathered data, for example, on the understaffing uh, of our regulatory agencies in the Orvi states with respect to inspectors. So Ted, Kathy, feel free to tell them what you found. Yeah, I mean, I could just respond a little bit of that. Uh, this was a hot issue in the state of West Virginia this year. There were several, there was a bill to, you know, uh, put more money into inspectors. And right now, West Virginia has about, I believe, about nine uh, inspectors. And it depends what well number you want to use. If you want to use all of the wells that have ever been drilled in West Virginia and possibly there, we're getting into hundreds of thousands. 
uh, if you get into the active wells in the states, you know, it's about little, uh, about 56,000 wells. And then there's lots of unactive wells. And I think one of the biggest concerns that I have in looking at this research is like every state determines how we plug and abandon a well. States do it all different. And a lot of places, they don't use best practices. You have to really remember, there's no money to be made in plugging wells unless you're getting a federal contract or you're contracting with another operator. You know, it's an, ex it's an expense for a company. So they want to spend it. Their incentive is to spend as less as possible to do the least amount because there's no return on investment for this uh, unless you own a plugging company, which Diversified is moving in that direction. Uh, so I think it's very important to have regulators go out to these wells to, to make sure they're not using the lowest quality cement, like Portland cement you get at Lowe's, but are using the correct materials. And one of the things that we found in the analysis too is that one reason that the drop in PNA or the plugging in 2021 is because the state of West Virginia issued a variance for their plugging regulations, which other organizations like West Virginia Soro, the Rivers Coalition, adamantly objected to because uh, they felt it would lead to plugging that was inadequate. And one of the problems, it's an epidemic problem across the United States, is that the plugging and, and abandonment procedures and processes are wholly inadequate. In large part, they haven't changed since the 70s. Uh, and that's a huge problem. But the problem too is like, if you don't have enough staff to go out there to examine this, to make sure the well is plugged well, to make sure that the restoration happens and the place is reclaimed, you know, you can get away with a lot. Uh, and that's a huge concern because we want to make sure that when companies PNA wells, that they do it right and that it's supposed to return to its natural habitat. And uh, so that's a huge problem. Uh, that I imagine we haven't figured out, especially in states like West Virginia that have so few. But the other states too, like Pennsylvania, have seen a reduction in the amount of staff they have too as well. Uh, but you know, the ratio between the number of wells and inspectors uh, you know, is very high and it makes it nearly impossible for people to do their job, let alone find you know, some of these well owners through transfers that happen or to find a, a well that might be owned it been abandoned by Standard Oil. And wait a minute, we know who Standard Oil is. That's, uh, we know who their parent company is. Uh, so, you know, tracking that back. And this is the part that Tony's talking about. It almost takes outsourcing to help them to be able to do that. Uh, and that's why there's just a great need to increase the amount of funding that these agencies have to be able to carry out their mission. Thank you. So um, we do, for those who are um, joining as attendees, we do have a few more minutes for questions. If there are any final questions that anyone would like to ask, feel free to pose them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and in the interim, Kathy, maybe I could just ask you to speak a little bit to where the financial data came from that you used to analyze the financial components of the report. Uh, thanks for the question, Joanne. Um, we took all of the financial data from publicly available sources um, and companies that are publicly traded are required to publish quarterly or annual financials. And so this was an analysis of the company's own reported data um, for their AROs, for their gain on bargain purchase, for their uh, federal well tax credit. Um, so all of that information really did come and we did a lot more analysis too that we did not include in the report. I think we could have, even though the report as you will all see is close to 50 pages with an additional 50 pages of appendices, we could really have written a lot more each of, each of us um, in our respective sections. So um, also, I think there is another question from, I think it is Reagan about transferring assets. Um, shall I answer that or give an attempt to? Sure, yeah, and I just wanted to make a quick note that, you know, we really want to focus this presentation on the content of the report. We're happy to have follow-up conversations um, 
afterward, you know, if, if anyone would like to reach out about additional work that might, you know, might be able to be done as a result of the report. Um, but yes, feel free, Kathy, to the extent that you're comfortable addressing that, the legal questions. I, th I think I would say that that is a legal question. It's called, I think, a fraudulent con conveyance. Um, and I don't know if citizens can challenge, but um, diversified, first of all, is not insolvent, um, even if it did um, mark its AROs up at a level that would be conforming to industry norms in terms of the average time period that many might think that these wells should be plugged and abandoned and used a more industry norm. It would mean that they're um, assets and their liabilities would come closer, but it does not mean that the company is actually insolvent. There are many definitions for insolvency. You could go down many rabbit holes with that and lawyers and accountants can disagree, but that may well be the law. I can't speak to that, but I do want to point out that I don't think that the claim that this company is insolvent would be accurate at this point. Thank you. Um, and Kathy, Tony answered this question, uh, but I wonder if you might want to add anything about why there have been no shareholder suits um, or you know whether something like that might be on the horizon. You know, it's always possible that shareholders will bring lawsuits. Um, right now, this company, as we mentioned, is listed on the London Stock Exchange. It was on an alternative exchange in London before that. And um, right now, the company is rewarding its shareholders with high dividend payments, and it is paying its debt. Um, it did indicate that if it continued to be able to reduce the cost of plugging and abandoning the wells at the rate it had been, that was in their most recent earnings, they pointed out that they might even be able to pay higher dividends than they are currently paying. It didn't say that that was going to be their corporate strategy, but it said it could be their corporate strategy because they would have additional funding. So in that particular case, shareholders may not be as eager to bring a lawsuit, but if they do, as um, Ted showed in one of his slides, have difficulty meeting their obligation and essentially not have enough money to meet that obligation to P&A, the shareholders might feel very differently at that point. So um, it, this remains to be seen. Thank you. Um, the next couple of questions are in really the similar category, which is around remedies. And Ted, I know you're you're working on a response about bonding rates. Um, and there's also a question about what needs to change to prevent this from happening. Um, so if uh, really to anyone on the panel, if you'd like to begin addressing some of the questions about recommendations or remedies. Yeah, I'm happy to start. I mean, I think it's going to take a combination of factors where bonding reform could produce good results when we're looking at the higher volume wells and the wells that are very productive. And the companies like EQT and Taro and others are producing a lot and, and you know we're able to do that. One of the problems is a large majority of these wells are low producing wells. And some of the, and as diversified, being a very large company, some of these wells are owned by smaller companies. And one potential problem is bonding, you know, a bonding company is likely, unlikely to bond some of these companies at rates that they can afford. So if you have to pay, uh, you know, if you had to pay, let's just say $50,000 for each well, and then your premium was three, 4% per year on that well, you know, you could, the state could end up with an avalanche of new orphan wells because some of these companies would be unable to do that. Uh, it seems from our analysis and work that a larger response is needed to deal with the 1 million plus orphaned wells on the one hand, and then in the United States, and then, then the active wells too. Something similar to the Federal Abandoned Mine Land Fund, which puts a fee on production, and that money goes into an account to help reclaim 
of those old event, thousands of old abandoned coal mines. Something similar to that, not a model by any means, it's very, been very inadequately funded through the years, uh, but the higher producing well companies are going to have to help pay for a lot of this because that's where the money is. Uh, those are the large, you know, diversified as a huge outlier and being a company that makes a decent amount of money on low producing wells. Very few companies can do that. There's very few companies that don't drill. You know, what makes diversified unique is that they don't drill. <laughs> they acquire. And that's a very different model of a company. And that's one of the reasons we looked at it, uh, because that definitely goes against the grain. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if we want to address all that issue, we're going to have to look to long-term solutions. And there's been bills introduced in legislatures, West Virginia's legislature. Uh, there was a bill called the Orphan Well Prevention Act that did just pretty similar to what I'm talking about, putting money into a fund. Uh, but the time horizon to take care of this, as production will probably decline, not just for diversified, but for all oil and gas companies, if we want to meet these carbon reduction goals, the, the time to get them to pay, industry to pay for is now. Because what could likely happen is, you know, uh, residents of these states or the federal or us, U.S. citizens, going to end up, you know, holding the bag later on and paying for it, which we don't want that to happen. So the window of opportunity now is to place a fee on that production, very similar to the AML fund, put into a fund and take care of this huge problem. And it's really important to understand, too, that it's not one plug and you're done. These wells need to be monitored forever. So the development of a federal program, uh, one policy analyst, uh, uh, Megan Mellican Bevan put together a policy of uh, creating the Abandoned Well Act, which I think is a really good example of what can happen at the federal level to ensure a, de a managed decline and to use a federal government uh, to work on this. Because to be honest with you, states, the reason we're in some of these problems is because states have managed this issue. Uh, and I think a federal response, you know, in all the states and having a federal workforce to deal with this, you know, could not only create thousands of jobs, but also could ensure that uh, we improve health and improve the environment all around the country. And in some cases, redevelop a lot of this property. With respect to what should be done about methane emissions, I have a number of recommendations. Number one, all the states, not just the Orvi states, should follow Pennsylvania's lead in requiring uh, multiple measurements, not estimates, not calculations, but actual measurements at the wellhead every year. But that's not enough. There has to be enforcement of those measurements. And when, an force, when enforcement is indicated a violation, there have to be stiff fines. Uh, there's no no benefit to a company to underreport if underreporting doesn't lead to any consequences. So there should be a carbon tax. And methane, as you well know, is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So there should be a fine for every cubic foot of methane that's leaked. And that fine should be <laughs> substantial. But there also needs to be a refinement in the regulations, even in Pennsylvania, so that re operators are required to use best available technology for leak detection and measurement. There is no requirement in the regulations in Pennsylvania right now for minimum capability or thresholds or accuracy. It's up to the operators. So in many cases in Diversified, we find that in thousands of their wells, the exact same emission is reported. How do you think about that? How could the emissions be exactly the same in thousands of wells? You'd expect <laughs> variability. So clearly they're not using best available technology with sufficient accuracy and resolution uh, to determine what the, what the emissions actually are. So it's easy for me to say those are the things that should happen. But as you well know, there's a lot of resistance right now at the state level and federal level to any tightening of methane emissions regulations especially in some of the Orvi states. Thank you, 
Well, I really appreciate everyone tuning in to hear this important information and the release of our new report. Um, we do have the full report available on our website, and we would also be happy to be available for future conversations if anyone would like to follow up after reviewing the full text of the report. Um, so thank you very much. And again, thank you to our authors and panelists. It's been very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.